All right, welcome to the chapter 17 lecture on climate change, a 21st century issue. We're going to talk about how the Earth is a greenhouse planet, geologic evidence for global warming and climate change, growth and knowledge about climate change, sources and impacts of principal greenhouse gases, the current state of knowledge about climate change, consequences of climate change, and addressing climate change. One of the obvious effects of climate change is the retreat of glaciers throughout the world. These photos show the Bear Glacier in Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska. The Bear Glacier has retreated more than six kilometers or about four miles between 2012 to 2019 and has continued to retreat since then. So you can see here's 1888 or 18, yeah, 1888 levels, 1950, 2000, 2005, 2015, 2018, 2019. That's dramatic change, right? The Earth is unique among planets in having temperature that allows water to exist in a liquid form. And all living things on Earth are primarily made up of water. Even our bodies are about more than 50% water. And all early forms of life developed in the oceans. The presence of liquid water is essential for life as we know it. Earth's temperature is determined by several factors. Our distance from the sun, changes in the energy output of the sun, the presence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Although Earth's orbit around the sun results in small changes in the distance between the Earth and the sun, the sun's energy changes slightly on about an 11 year cycle. And these differences appear to have little effect on Earth's temperature. Several gases in the atmosphere are transparent to ultraviolet and visible light, but absorb infrared radiation. Infrared is heat. These gases allow sunlight to penetrate and be absorbed by the Earth's surface. And when sun energy is re-radiated as infrared radiation or heat, some of it is absorbed by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Because the effect is similar to what happens in a greenhouse, these gases are called greenhouse gases, and the warming that occurs because of their presence is called the greenhouse effect. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and although the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is small, its effect is significant. According to NASA, if there were no CO2 in the atmosphere, our temperature would be about 18 degrees, negative 18 degrees Celsius or zero degrees Fahrenheit, instead of the current temperature of about 15 C or 60 Fahrenheit. The greenhouse effect caused by the presence of carbon dioxide makes Earth suitable for life. So having some CO2 in our atmosphere is really important. Here's a good diagram of how the greenhouse effect works. We have solar radiation that can pass through the clear part of the atmosphere. It's absorbed by Earth's surface and warms it. And as that heat is re-radiated back out towards space, greenhouse gases capture and lock in some of that heat, much like the glass on a greenhouse does. The phrases global warming and climate change are sometimes used interchangeably. They're different aspects of the same problem. Global warming relates to an average increase in the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere. Climate change refers to the many other changes that come about because of global warming. Geologic studies of Earth's history show that Earth's climate has changed significantly over time. Some geologic periods were hotter than today, and some were colder. Evidence of continental glaciers that covered large portions of North America, Europe, and Asia brought about a recognition that climate change had happened in the recent geologic past, right? The Ice Age. Here's continental glaciers. So Michigan was at one time completely covered by the Laurentide Ice Sheet. This would have been during the last ice age. Here's a graph of change in average global temperatures. So on the y-axis we have deviation from long-term averages. So how different 
as the temperature from the long-term average and then year of course on the x-axis so up until the 1930s we every year was lower than the long-term average cooler than the long-term average from the mid 30s through 1980 it was kind of an even split oscillating around that average temperature and since the 1980s every every year has been warmer than the long-term average so there's a clear linear pattern here right Growth and knowledge of global warming and climate change has also changed over time. The average temperature of the Earth has been increasing, and scientists initially tried to determine if the warming was a natural phenomenon or the result of human activity. Evidence of past climate change going back as far as 160,000 years indicates a close correlation between the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and global temperatures. Computer models of climate indicate that as greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increase, Earth will get warmer and many climate changes will occur. Other evidence of climate change incurs, includes records of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere show a steady increase. Studies of gas bubbles trapped in glaciers indicate that what the atmosphere was like before the time of the Industrial Revolution that began in the mid 1700s and no surprise co2 levels were lower then satellite photos show how ice and snow conditions have changed and migration behavior of several terrestrial and marine animals show changes in the timing of migration and the routes that are taken ocean studies of co2 content pH chains and other changes in chemistry. Changes in growing season. Growing seasons are longer. If you're a gardener, um, they recently redid the the growth growing zones, um, and those maps look a lot different now than they did uh, when they were made the last time about 20 years ago. Physical measurements of the retreat of glaciers in the thickness of ice sheets. Effects of increased carbon dioxide on photosynthesis, wind patterns, ocean currents, effects of particulates from the natural um, and human activities on climate, sea level measurements, ocean levels are rising as more ice melts, there's more water, sea levels rise. Frequency and strength of tropical storms have also changed. Uh, and, and by change, I mean, we have more of them and they're stronger and more catastrophic than they have been historically. There's a lot of research that's ongoing related to climate change. There's a lot of ways you can get involved in research, especially if you choose to pursue a degree at a four-year institution. Um, there are studies on the effect of changes in ocean pH on organism, studies of hurricane strength and frequency, changes in snow cover, studies of changes in seasons on animals, and studies of changes in migra migratory behavior of birds, and there's also studies of ice cores from glaciers, and these are just a handful of ways that scientists are working to better understand climate change. Sources and impacts of principal greenhouse gases. So I've mentioned carbon dioxide already, but it's not the only greenhouse gas that's playing an important role here. Methane, CFCs, and nitrogen, nitrous oxides are also important gases that help to trap in heat and warm the earth. So CO2 is the most abundant of the greenhouse gases and responsible for about 65% of the global warming impact. It occurs as a natural consequence of cell respiration and fermentation by organisms. Large quantities, however, are put in the atmosphere as a waste product of burning fossil fuels. Another factor contributing to the increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is deforestation. Trees are long-lived organisms whose structure is an excellent carbon sink. 
measurement of CO2 levels at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And this is a like a astrological astro not astrological astronomical observatory. Um, it shows that the CO2 level have increased from 317 parts per million in 1960 to over 411 parts per million in 2019. It's an increase of nearly 30%. And it's generally accepted that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere prior to the Industrial Revolution was only 280 parts per million. That means the current concentration represents an increase of 47% over pre-industrial concentrations. That's a big change. Here's a graph showing the same relationship. All right, methane is the second most abundant greenhouse gas. It's responsible for about 17% of global warming, and it comes from biological sources and as a byproduct of fossil fuel use. There are several microbes that are particularly abundant in wetlands and rice paddies that release methane into the atmosphere. Many animals also have microbes in their digestive systems that break down food and release methane. Ruminants and termites are some examples of these. Natural gas is primarily methane and oil and coal. Uh, and they contain some methane as well. Natural gas is primarily in... This is worded so oddly. I'm sorry. Methane is primarily in natural gas and oil and coal. They also contain some methane as well. Um, currently, the amount of methane in the atmosphere is increasing. Pre-industrial concentrations were about 700 parts per billion. The concentrations today are around 1,870 parts per billion. Here's a graph of atmospheric methane. Change over time. All right, nitrous oxide is a minor component of the greenhouse gas picture. It enters the atmosphere primarily through the use of fertilizers and fossil fuels. Nitrogen containing fertilizers and animal manure are used to improve agricultural production and nitrogen compounds. Some soil bacteria can convert these into nitrous oxide. Air contains both oxygen and nitrogen. And during the process of burning fossil fuels, oxygen and nitrogen combine to produce a variety of nitrous oxides. And here's a graph of the change in nitrous oxide con concentrations in the atmosphere over time. You notice all these different greenhouse gases have the same trend. They're all on the upward. Chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, are synthetic compounds that are a minor component of the greenhouse gas picture. There are no natural sources of CFCs. They were widely used as refrigerant gases um, or cleaning solvents, propellants in aerosol containers, and expanders in foam products. CFCs are extremely efficient as greenhouse gases and about 15,000 times more efficient at retarding heat loss than carbon dioxide gas. Because CFCs are a major cause of ozone destruction, production of CFCs has been sharply reduced and scheduled to be eliminated by 2020. Atmospheric levels of CFC are decreasing. All right, here's a table walking you through the different types of greenhouse gases. Their pre-industrial revolution levels, their current levels, and their contributions to global warming. This would be a really great table to study and be able to produce from memory. All right, the current state of knowledge about climate change. In 1988, the United Nations Environment Program and World Meteorological Organization established the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, to study the issue and make recommendations. The main activity of the IPCC is to provide an assessment of the state of knowledge about climate change at regular intervals. The IPCC is organized in several working groups. Working Group 1 deals with the physical science that relates to climate change. Working Group 2 deals with the impacts of climate change. 
and working group three deals with how to mitigate the effects of climate change. Working group one published its portion of the fifth assessment report in 2013, uh, and they had 259 scientists from around the world involved in writing portions of this report. More than 600 scientists contributed material for the report. It was a massive scientific effort. The report restated several important conclusions from previous reports and added some new observations. First, human activity is clearly influencing climate. This is not a debate in the scientific community. This is an established fact. Increased concentrations of greenhouse gases, particularly CO2, are causing an increase in the temperature. And third, evidence of increased temperature is clear. There is no debate in the scientific community about any of these things. They also stated in their report that evidence of increased temperature is clear, meaning the average temp of the earth, temperature of the earth has increased 1.2 to 1.9 degrees Fahrenheit since 1880. Amounts of spring snow and ice have decreased in the northern hemisphere and snow is melting earlier in the year. The number of cold days has decreased and the number of warm days has increased. The Arctic region is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the world. And this is something really interesting. The greatest impacts of global climate change will be felt at the poles. The closer you get to the equator, the less dramatic the changes are. And of course, most of the world's population, or especially in our country, the voting populace, is located much closer to the equator than the poles, right? And this is why we see a lot of climate change stuff coming out of Alaska for our country, because Alaska is so much further north, they are experiencing climate change in a very different way than we in Michigan are. And even us in Michigan are experiencing climate change in a different way than a more southern state like Georgia might. So keep that in mind. The Arctic region is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the world. Permafrost or permanently frozen soil, temperatures have increased two to three degrees Celsius and the thickness of the permafrost layer in the area of the world that has permafrost has decreased. One upside to this is the super cool organisms we find that have been preserved so well in permafrost. As the permafrost melts, we've found really well preserved um, dire wolf, uh, mully mammoths, um, I'm trying to think of some others. I think there were, have been some human remains um, that have come out of the permafrost that have been really valuable scientific finds. Um, but on the whole, permafrost thawing is a really bad sign. It's, it's supposed to be permanently frozen. All right, some other findings are there's been a reduction in the area covered by Arctic sea ice at the end of sum summer. Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets have been losing mass. Glaciers are melting. And the arrival of spring is earlier in many parts of the world. Now, in the Arctic, uh, normally there has been historically a solid Arctic sea ice pack. So the whole northern tip of the globe basically has historically frozen solid every year. And this is really important for seals to be able to breed. It's important for polar bears to be able to hunt. Um, and it's really critical for the function of Arctic, Arctic biology. Um, and in recent years, it has not frozen solid. Um, and that's going to have some really dramatic impacts for the communities up there. All right, increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and increased temperature are affecting oceans. About 28% of carbon dioxide emissions end up in the ocean. Increased CO2 dissolved in water has decreased the pH by 0.1 pH unit, or a 26% increase in the hydrogen ion concentration. It's acidifying the oceans. 
about 90% of the additional energy added to the earth has been stored in the oceans, resulting in an increase of about 0.8 degrees Fahrenheit in the temperature of the upper 75 meters of the oceans in the last 40 years. Sea level has risen about 7.5 inches between 1901 and 2010. And the rate of sea level rise has been increasing and was about 3.2 millimeters per year from 93 to 2010. In 2019, the sea level was rising at about 3.4 millimeters per year. Millimeters per year, three millimeters may not sound like a lot, but over 10 years, we're talking about more than three centimeters. And for coastal areas like Florida or any of the seacoast, but especially Florida's very low in elevation, this is going to become very meaningful and have real impacts in the near future. Consequences of climate change. A small increase in the average temperature of the earth may seem trivial. However, such an increase could set in motion changes that could significantly alter the climate of major regions of the world. Computer models suggest that rising temperature will lead to changes in the hydrologic cycle, sea level, human health, the survival and distribution of organisms, and the use of natural resources by people. Some natural ecosystems or human settlements will be able to withstand or adapt to changes, but others will not. Poor nations are generally more vulnerable to the consequences of global warming. These nations tend to be more dependent on economic activity that's climate sensitive, like subsistence agriculture, and the lack of economic resources to adjust to changes that global warming may bring. The, inter the IPCC has identified Africa as the continent most vulnerable to the impacts of projected changes because widespread poverty limits its adaptive adaptive capabilities. <clears throat> Working group two of IPC lists eight major risks. <clears throat> First, the risk of death or harm from coastal flooding. The risk to health and livelihoods from inland flooding. Risk of severe weather, disrupting infrastructure and public services. Remember Hurricane Katrina? Risk of death and illness due to extreme heat. Risk of food insecurity due to warming, drought, or flooding. Risk to agricultural productivity due to a shortage of water for irrigation and drinking. Risk of loss of marine and coastal ecosystem services. And risk of loss of terrestrial and freshwater ecosystem services. Oceans are intimately interrelated with climate. Equatorial waters are warmer than other parts of the ocean. Uneven heating helps to fuel wind patterns, right? Remember in the air pollution or air quality lecture, we talked about how air flows as sunlight comes down and warms the air that's at the surface of the earth. That warm air rises. As it rises, it's cooled as it mixes with um, higher elevations of air in our atmosphere and it sinks back down to be warmed again so we have air circulating. This is especially important over oceans. Uneven heating causes wind patterns <clears throat> and oceans are the ultimate source of water vapor for rain and snow. Prevailing winds and water vapor from oceans causes weather patterns that begin over oceans and move over land. Increased open ocean temperature, about 90% of additional heat from climate change is absorbed by the ocean. And in 2019, the average surface temperature of the ocean was about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit above the long-term average. The oceans are becoming acidic. <clears throat> about 25% of the CO2 released is absorbed by ocean waters. And the CO2 dissolved in water creates carbonic acid. That's the same acid that's in a, a soda pop or a sparkling water. There's been about a 0.1 pH unit decrease 
or a 33% increase in acidity. Remember, as pH goes down, the water becomes more acidic, right? Many marine organisms have difficulty constructing and maintaining their skeletal structures. Things like corals and seashells, these are made from calcium carbonate, which is the major ingredients, I believe, in Tums. So if you imagine what happens if you put Tums in a can of pop, it's going to fizzle and there's not going to be much left of that Tums before long, right? The same thing is happening to structures in marine marine life, um, like seashells and coral. The water cycle has also been disrupted. Um, so evaporation, precipitation, water flow, groundwater, it's all driven by energy. And the primary source of energy is the temperature of the earth. And that of course is determined by the input of energy from the sun and the heat trapping effect of the greenhouse gases. So it follows that a change in Earth's temperature is expected to affect a change in the weather and climate on Earth. Weather is a term we use for short-term activities like temperature changes, rain and snow events, wind, clouds, and other factors. Climate is the long-term average of weather patterns. Thus, if climate is changing, we should expect to see changes in weather patterns also. Higher temperatures result in increased evaporation. Some areas are going to become drier. We'll have drought with less water in lakes and rivers. Some areas will have greater rainfall. Floods, more severe storms, wetter soils. Snowfall patterns are also expected to change with some areas receiving more snow and others receiving less than they have historically. This is a table of weather-related events that caused more than a billion dollars in damage just in the U.S. I assume these numbers are adjusted for inflation. Um, so from 1980 to 1999, these are the different types of storms we had and their costs. Compare that to the next 20-year period and their costs. That's a significant difference. Recent data suggests that the amount of spring snow has decreased. Snow is melting earlier in the year. Hurricanes are more powerful. And there are more hot days and fewer cold days. Spring is arriving earlier in the U.S. Rising sea levels. A warmer earth will result in rising sea levels for two different reasons. When water increases in temperature, it expands and takes up more space. In addition, higher temperatures are causing the melting of glaciers, which is putting more water into oceans. Rising sea levels will erode beaches and coastal wetlands, inundate low-lying areas, and increase the vulnerability of coastal areas to flooding and storm surges and intense rainfall. By 2100, the IPCC projects sea levels to have risen by 26 to 98 centimeters. We're talking 10 to 39 inches. A 50 centimeter or 20 inch sea level rise will result in substantial loss of coastal land in North America, especially along the Southern Atlantic and Gulf coasts, which are subsiding and particularly vulnerable. Many coastal cities would be significantly affected by an increase in sea level. Worldwide, about 600 million people live in these low-lying coastal areas. Where will they go when those places are underwater? The land area of some island nations and countries such as Bangladesh would dramatically change if this flooding occurred. So here's a picture. Um, coastal somewhere. I'm not sure where. Um, but a coastal area, September 6th of 2014. So there's a kind of like a, an earthen barrier between the ocean and inland waterways. And in 2016, that barrier was breached, allowing ocean waters to pour directly into this coastal wetland. Oh, Hurricane Matthew. 
I gotta read my own captions. All right, changes to ecosystems. Geographic distribution of organisms will change and we've seen this already. Terrestrial plants and animals are shifting their range toward the poles. Possums actually are one we see in North America. Possums are living further north now than they have historically. And we'll continue to see these shifts coming up. Tundra regions are converting to forests. Ocean organisms like plankton, fish, and mammals are also shifting their ranges. Coral reefs are affected because of increased ocean temperature and acidity. Mangrove forests and marshes on shorelines are being affected by the sea level rise and storm surges from more violent weather events. The most direct effect of climate change is the impact of hotter temperatures. Extremely hot temperatures increase the number of people who die of various causes on a given day. For example, people with heart problems are vulnerable because their cardiovascular systems have to work harder to keep their body cool when the weather is very hot. Heat exhaustion and respiratory problems will increase. Climate change will also make air pollution problems worse. Higher air temperature increases the concentration of ozone at ground level, which leads to injury of lung tissue and increases the incidence of respiratory disease like asthma and allergies. Because children and the elderly are the most vulnerable, they will suffer disproportionately from both warmer temperatures and poor air quality. Tropical diseases could migrate to former temperate regions. Several serious diseases appear only in warm areas, but as the earth becomes warmer, some of these tropical diseases may be able to spread to parts of the world where they didn't previously occur. And we have seen this happen in Florida. In Florida, there's Zika virus, which is carried by mosquitoes. Those mosquitoes weren't previously able to survive in Florida, it was too far north, but now they can. And um, this is where we see people with getting Zika virus. So in a regular healthy person, Zika virus um, is kind of like a mild cold or a flu. But if you're pregnant, um, and you become infected with Zika virus, it can cause microcephaly in your baby. Babies born with heads that are too small. Um, some scientists believe that algal blooms could occur more frequently as well as temperatures rise. So there's a lot of big ecological changes that are coming as climate is changing. Climate strongly affects crop yields. So yields may fall in regions where drought and heat stress increase. In regions that have increased rainfall and warming temperatures, yields should increase. However, episodes of severe weather will cause crop damage that will affect yields. A warmer climate will alter the kinds of crops that can be grown in an area and increase irrigation demands. Expansion of the geographic ranges of insect pests could also increase vulnerability and result in greater use of pesticides. Total world agricultural productivity is not likely to change much. Um, regional changes will occur. Some will have reduced productivity. Poorer regions of the world are likely to suffer decreased productivity. All right, so addressing climate change. What can we do about this? Energy efficiency and green energy. Improving energy efficiency has the double impact of reducing carbon dioxide release and conserving the shrinking supplies of energy resources. It makes sense to increase energy efficiency, even if global warming is not a concern. Attacks on the amount of carbon individuals and corporations released into the atmosphere would increase efficiency. This would increase the cost of fuels and stimulate a demand for fuel efficient products because the cost of fuel would rise. It would also stimulate the development of alternative fuels with lower carbon content, generate funds for research in many aspects for fuel efficiency and alternative fuel technologies. Energy efficiency and green energy. One way to stimulate a move towards greater efficiency would be to place a tax on the amount of carbon individuals and corporations can release in the atmosphere. 
I feel like we just said that. Um, it can also increase efficiency and reductions in greenhouse gas that are more likely to have important related benefits to offset those costs. Greater energy efficiency would lead to reduced air pollution, which would result in lower health care costs and time loss from work. A study in China determined that there's about 1 million premature deaths per year in China due to, pre due to air pollution. And greater energy efficiency reduces the need for new power plants and related infrastructure. Switching to green sources of energy like wind, solar, and hydroelectric, as well as nuclear power, do not release CO2 and lead to reduced carbon dioxide emissions. Forests are also really good stores of carbon. Trees live for a long time, and their mass is mostly made up of carbon that the trees have pulled from the air and stored in their tissue. Since carbon is an important component of living things, what happens to biomass has a role to play in determining atmospheric CO2 levels. Forests consisting of many long-lived tree species can tie up carbon for centuries. And preserving forests slows the rate of increase of atmospheric CO2. This is particularly true for tropical forests since they're the last remaining major unmodified forested areas in the world. And they're very efficient at capturing carbon dioxide. The burning of tropical rainforests to provide farm or grazing land adds CO2 to the atmosphere and it reduces the rainforest's ability to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. A commonly cited estimate is that 10% of the additional carbon dioxide enter entering the atmosphere is due to deforestation. Planting trees has also been supported as a way to reduce atmospheric CO2. The long-lived plants will tie up carbon for longer periods of time than grasses or other short-lived plants. Critics argue that this approach will only provide a short-term benefit. Eventually, the trees will mature and die, and their decay will release that CO2 back into the atmosphere at some later time. The U.S. Department of Energy has concluded that relying primarily on already proven technology, the U.S. could reduce its carbon emission by almost 400 million metric tons. This is enough to stabilize U.S. emissions at 1990 levels. Technological approaches. Alternative energy sources like wind, solar, hydroelectric, geothermal, and nuclear power don't release CO2 and can replace current fossil fuel energy sources. Fossil fuels currently provide about 90% of the world's energy, and converting to a greater reliance on non-fossil fuel energy sources will require a great deal of new construction and technological improvements. Preventing carbon dioxide from being released into the atmosphere. So CO2 can be reacted to produce a solid carbonate minerals like limestone is calcium carbonate. That could be stored in landfills. Carbon dioxide can be captured and stored underground. Technological changes come with a cost that will be paid by the consumer. Government policies that stimulate the development of these technologies will be needed. All right, and there are some international agreements in place. We talked in the air quality lecture about the Montreal Protocol, um, which has a section dealing with CFCs. It established to phase out CFC production, required significant technological changes, and CFCs in the atmosphere have begun to decline. Changes made to protect the ozone layer had the side benefit of reducing the release of a potent greenhouse gas. The Kyoto Protocol, dealing with greenhouse gases. This was established in 1997. It, economically developed countries are required to limit their greenhouse gas emissions below 1990 levels. Economically developing countries did not have requirements. And that includes nearly all of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. The goals were to be met by 2012, and most countries of the world ratified the treaty. The U.S. did not officially ratify the treaty. In 
in 2006, China became the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, followed by the U.S. and the EU. The Kyoto Protocol expired in 2012, and an agreement was reached to extend the protocol through 2020. The new agreement required that all countries publish plans for reducing greenhouse gases. The Paris Agreement. This established goals to cut greenhouse gas emissions as a follow-up to the Kyoto Protocol. They met in Paris in 2015, and the goals of the agreement were to prevent human activity from causing a 2 degrees Celsius increase in global temperatures within this century. The goal was to keep it below 1.5 C. The mechanism for achieving this goal is that each country needs to publish its plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There will be nationally determined contributions, and each country has pledged to report every five years on the progress and revise their plans. Developed countries pledge to provide funding to help developing countries, and we call that the Green Climate Fund. So what's the progress of this? The U.S. withdrew from the Paris Agreement in 2017. Many U.S. states, cities, and companies continue to work toward their related climate goals, and the U.S. will likely rejoin the Paris Agreement. The European industrialized countries are meeting their NDCs, and funding for the Green Climate Fund is not meeting the goal of $100 billion. All right, the Madrid Climate Change Meeting took place in 2019. The goals were to establish how countries' NDCs will be measured um, and establish a carbon credit training mechanism, which was not achieved. Uh, they needed to develop a plan for compensating developing countries for the damage they've incurred because of the energy use in developed countries. No agreement was reached. And to encourage more aggressive greenhouse gas reductions Current NDCs do not meet the goal of limiting temperature increase to 2 degrees Celsius. Further action has been deferred to the next meeting. The Kigali Agreement, dealing with CFCs and hydrofluorocarbons. CFCs and HFCs destroy stratospheric ozone and their greenhouse gases. The Kigali Agreement is an amendment to the Montreal Protocol it phases out the production of HFCs in addition to CFCs. So in summary, the concept of climate change is not new. Geologic studies have demonstrated that climates have changed greatly over Earth's history. Today's climate change is different in that it's highly likely that it's been caused by human activities. The primary greenhouse gases are CO2, nitrous oxides, methane, and CFCs. These gases are strongly linked to an increase in the average temperature of the Earth and consequently are leading to major changes in the climate. These include warming of the Earth, particularly near the poles. The warming will result in melting of permafrost, glaciers, and sea ice, changes in rain and snowfall patterns, shift in the distribution of plants and animals, more intense heat waves and severe storms, a rise in sea level, and acidification of the oceans. Other likely effects of climate change are health effects on humans, extinction of some plants and animals, flooding of cities, and changes in agricultural productivity or activity. The primary factor involved in climate change appears to be the carbon dioxide released from burning fossil fuels. And since fossil fuel use is closely tied to economic development, Many developing countries are unwilling to accept its limits to their use of fossil fuels. All right, that's it for the Chapter 17 lecture. If you have questions, write them down. Talk to me about them. We can meet in student office hours or bring them to class. All right?